it can be said that suffering uh, is in different ways essential to the very nature of man and to our lives on earth. Uh, it's also a mystery that is something that we may perhaps come to understand to some degree, uh, but with a seemingly endless remainder of aspects that we don't understand. And it's a mystery both on a natural level, uh, expressible as a philosophical aporia. Uh, aporia means a puzzle or a paradox. It's also a divinely revealed mystery in the Christian religion. Philosophy and theology have different but compatible approaches and answers to the problem of suffering. In this brief talk, I intend to do no more than briefly point to, uh, in the direction of the resolution of the philosophical difficulty. It's rather involved. It's all rather involved. Uh, There's such a brief talk. And then to present just a few reflections on human suffering as a poignant mystery of, of Christian faith. Necessarily, then, many aspects of suffering are going to be left untreated. Uh, but we can address some of those in the Q&A, if you like. Uh, finally, I don't pretend to have all the answers or even all the correct answers uh, to aspects of the problem of human suffering. And I'm open to correction, open to the truth. So let's start with a philosophical analysis or investigation, then we'll move to the theological. Um, theology is actually an academic discipline, just not in, in state schools. Usually it's like religious studies or something. Okay. All right. The 18th century philosopher uh, David Hume, in part 10 of his great work, The Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion, he says, or he wrote, in the person of his character, Philo, who's quoting Epicurus, who was the ancient Greek philosopher, uh, quote, is God willing to prevent evil but not able? Then he's impotent. Is God able to prevent suffering but not willing? Then he's malevolent. If, if he's both able and willing, then whence then is evil? That is, where does it come from? Allegedly, Epicurus went on to say, is he neither able or willing? And then why even call him God at all? Okay. So there's some hidden presumptions or premises here we have to tease out. Uh, contemporary analytic philosophers like the late Marilyn McCord Adams, who was an Episcopal priest, taught uh, philosophy at Yale, uh, <clears throat> express Hume's problem as follows. Uh, so the claim would be, or the worry, the fear would be, that the following two propositions are inconsistent. First, God is omniscient, that is all-knowing, omnibenevolent, that is all-loving, and omnipotent, that is able to do all things. And I'll explain my note in a second, just ignore that for a second. And the second proposition is evil exists. These seem incompatible. Hume, Hume is difficult to read, uh, difficult to interpret, but Hume seems to be saying that there's an inconsistency. He doesn't go as far as saying there's a, a logical uh, contradiction, but that there's an inconsistency between these two, okay? So now I'll tell you. What you're so look, God's omnipotence is often, I think, seriously misunderstood, or, or what omnipotence means is, is often seriously misunderstood. Um, sometimes the clever question is asked, can God uh, make a rock so heavy he can't lift it? Right? And so it seems like there's a dilemma. If he, if, he, if he can't make the rock, then he's not um, omnipotent. But if he can make it, then he can't lift it. He's still, you know, he's not omnipotent. Right? He's omnipotent. Yeah. So here's the, the thing about omnipotence um, and word games, right? Omnipotence is the power to be able to do anything real, right? So, for example, we said, can you learn calculus? Let's say you don't know it, but could you learn it? Yes. You have the, ability, you have the power, the potency to learn it, right? But can you make a square circle, take Euclidean geometry, a square circle, right? Can you do that? No. Why? Because you lack the power? No, because it's not an it. It's a funny word game. A square circle is just as much an impossible being as um, a rock so heavy that an omnipotent being can't lift it. Okay. So anyway, I didn't intend to go into that, but I, had, I felt I had to just explain why, what, what I was trying to tell myself. 
Um, and I'm telling myself, oh, look into that more some other time. All right. So here's the, here's the aporia in Hume. Uh, God is omniscient, omnibenevolent, and omnipotent. This is the God of classical theism. The God of Aristotle, even Plato, approaches an understanding of the deity in this fashion. Uh, and then in the great Jewish, Catholic, Muslim tradition of philosophy, their theistic approaches are similar. All the way through the Middle Ages to the modern period, and then the Enlightenment, things tend to fall apart. So this is the God of classical theism. And there are proofs, philosophical proofs, that there exists such a God and that he has these perfections and others as well. All right. Hume, with this argument, starts or revives a trend in philosophy that developed into the position recently expressed by the late J.L. Mackey, namely that religious beliefs, for this reason, are not just inconsistent, but positively irrational because of an additional premise that Mackey ex explicitly states. So you can see this in the bibliography there. Uh, J.L. Mackey, Evil and Omnipotence, in the book The Problem of Evil. Uh, <clears throat> Marilyn McCord Adams' book is also in that bibliography at the top. Horrendous Evils and the Goodness of God. It's a fantastic book. Uh, so the, th the, the third premise that Mackey adds is this, quote, it's logically impossible for an omniscient, omnibenevolent, and omnipotent being to have a morally sufficient reason for permitting or bringing about evils. So he raises the stakes all the way up. Okay? You could live with an inconsistency because the, the, the inconsistency may be apparent. It may just appear inconsistent, but it may not be. And so you keep investigating. But if you definitively close the door and say there's a logical uh, impossibility here, uh, then that's a different game altogether. Okay. Um, Here's a, so that's the, that's the philosophical problem. So now I'm going to point in the direction of philosophical responses. What that means is I, I'm not going to present any of them as a definitive response, but you get a, a sense of the, the various species or ways that different thinkers have tried to respond to this problem. Okay. One obvious way is to just say there's no God. Okay. Uh, one way that no one's taken, and for I think obvious reasons, is evil isn't real. Evil's real. Okay. Uh, and I guess I should make this clear, evil and suffering, the connection, right? So, so suffering is the sensitive creature, animal, or human's response, you know, to uh, evil, okay? In, in extremely vague and abstract terminology, that's what it is. All right. So in uh, her book, Adams, uh, in Horrendous Evils and the Goodness of God, she, she taxonomizes, she provides a taxonomy of various responses to this problem. But first, uh, I'd like to make this point. It should be noted that sound philosophical proofs, sound philosophical proofs for the existence of an omniscient, omnibenevolent, and omnipotent God, if there are any, would not and do not lose their soundness. So in philosophy, soundness indicates uh, something very specific, formal validity, so we've taken symbolic logic and you have an idea of what that is, formal validity and material truth. So if you have a, a sound philosophical argument, okay, um, <clears throat> it doesn't lose its soundness because of difficulties, right? Uh, and this is true for any other genuine knowledge of God. Knowledge, not conjecture or hypothesis, but knowledge in kind of the Aristotelian sense where you know something is and that it isn't otherwise. Okay? It's not a conjecture. Uh, and that includes even knowledge of a religious variety, if that were possible. I think it is. Surprise. I'm a theologian. Uh, if I know there's a God, somehow, philosophically or otherwise, objections, however serious and seemingly insoluble, don't take away that knowledge. In his Apologia Pro Vita Sua, John Henry Newman wrote uh, famously, quote, uh, 10,000 difficulties do not a doubt make. Okay. Um, she writes in her book, quote, there are total refutations. This is an epistemic defense, right? Um, also known as skeptical theism. The late Brian Davies from Fordham has a whole book on this, and he's in the bibliography as well. Uh, they uh, boldly deny that evils are even prima facie evidence against God's existence because God's ways are so much higher 
than ours that we wouldn't expect to be aware of divine reasons for their permission, for the permission of evil, if, if there are any, okay? So it's, it's, I find this one of the more unsatisfying responses, but it's just God's ways are so, he's not a human, right? So we, we, we can't quickly say there's no reason, even though we don't see one, for suffering. Second, defenses. And it's funny that that's the word for this category because they're all, in a sense, defenses. But this is a, a category of response. Defenses, she says, trot out armies of possible reasons why God might permit such evils, contending that even if we don't know the actual reasons, the greater the number of apparently available reasons, the less obviously pointless are the evils in question. So it's a kind of, degree, it's kind of a scale of probability. And uh, in this book... Uh, Dr. Eleanor Stump, Wandering in Darkness, big book from St. Louis University. She um, provides a very long set of defenses in the this, in this strict sense, right? They're, they're, they're not attempts to say this is the reason God would permit evil. They're attempts to say these are reasons that are legitimate that God could have for permitting evil or suffering. Okay. And then finally, theodicies comes from the Greek word theos, God, and DK or dikaiosune, justifying God, you know, saying he's still a good guy, okay, or a good being, not a guy. All right. Uh, Theodicy suggests actual reasons, uh, whether on the grounds of revelation or of common sense. So, so they're very similar to defenses, whereas defenses provide hypothetical possibilities for why evil could be compatible with God. Theodicies actually make the claim that these are the actual reasons God has. Okay. All right. Epistemic defenses often run like this. This is the first category. We're not in an epistemic position to know whether and how human suffering fits into the plan of an omniscient, omnipotent, omnibenevolent, providential God. It's not clear that suffering is unfitting, especially since we have plenty of analogies from the created order showing that human suffering, while truly horrible on one level, is rather important and serves a good function on another level. For example, uh, medical doctor James Hudson, in a recent Washington Post article from last year entitled Our Dangerous Fear of Pain, writes, quote, the fear of pain and the belief that a pain-free existence is optimal or even possible has been a catastrophe for patients. And his principal concern is the op opioid crisis, which he traces ideologically to the, to, the, to, to the attitude that we've got to get rid of pain at all costs. And so he thinks that it's not right medically, scientifically. Okay? It's not that pain's good, but it serves an important function. All right. uh, this is true, you could even argue, not only physically, medically, but also uh, psychically, uh, emotionally, morally, you could argue, some argue. Uh, there's a real demonstrable danger in attempting to eliminate pain at all costs. Yet, even though the value of suffering, so here's a critique I have of this, okay? Even though the, the, this argument, even though the value of suffering from a finite perspective may be shown, like in this article by the medical doctor, um, that value doesn't necessarily translate univocally, point for point, when considering it from a divine eternal perspective, right? Uh, we may have to... Um, inflict pain to cut off a gangrenous limb, but an infinite omnipotent being could simply uh, he he heal the limb, remove the gangrene, restore vitality. So, it, it, so these, there's something about these arguments that don't seem to go far enough, I don't think. Um, I'm not sure. It's tricky. Um, and, and that's a point that Hume himself makes, and it's an important one that we need to be careful not to anthropomorphize God. Now, 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 in the Christian faith, God becomes incarnate. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. But, but, but God doesn't cease being God. So we don't anthropomorphize uh, a being of omnipotence. Okay? We preserve the, the divinity, respect for the divinity, for the uh, infinitude of God. The inf infinite transcendent God is not an agent in the material universe like other rational agents like us. So the epistemic defense, you can put it simply like this. There's nothing clearly inconsistent, let alone irrational, in the calm possibility, the compatibility of evil and an omnipotent, omnibenevolent, omniscient God, because God could have a good reason for allowing it. So uh, it seems like a somewhat weak defense, but I think that's worth looking at. Okay? Uh, Brian Davies' book on the bibliography there is called The Reality of God and the Problem of Evil. 
Eleanor Stump, in this big book, Wandering in Darkness, uh, provides a defense argument. Again, that's an argument that provides possible reasons why the God of classical theism could consistently permit suffering. But she also gives an excellent summary of St. Thomas Aquinas' theodicy argument. And the theodicy argument, which she doesn't totally agree with, uh, is an argument that gives actual reasons why God permits suffering. And Aquinas' theodicy argument is not purely philosophical. He appeals to divine revelation and say these are the reasons, some of them God told us, these are the reasons why he permits suffering. And they're always for some good end. Um, we'll look at this in, in, in just a second. Um, I highly recommend her book. It's, it's one of the most thoughtful and helpful philosophical and Christian attempts to engage the problem of suffering. Uh, just recently came out a few years ago. Um, I'd like to summarize her position and Aquinas' position briefly and then turn to uh, a set of Christian theological reflections on human suffering and, and then we'll just discuss it if you want in the Q&A. To understand Aquinas' position, it's essential on, on God and suffering. It's essential first to understand his scale of value. This is necessary because morally to, to justify, to morally justify God permitting humans to suffer, you have to find in his mind a, a great, well, actually, we, we just have to find, whether it's his mind or any mind, we have to find greater goods to attain or lesser evils, or sorry, or greater evils to avoid that are brought about precisely through suffering. So in other words, to justify God in the face of suffering, you have to find you have to have a scale of values that provides the foundation or basis for determining a, a scale of goods. Some are better uh, and greater, and, and, and some evils are worse. And so suffering could be justified to avoid a worse evil or to attain, attain a greater good. Okay? Um, redressing uh, the objection requires the discovery of a morally sufficient reason for suffering. So I, you can guess now, I, I, I uh, think Mackey's third uh, premise is, is reasonable. I mean, not, well, not reasonable, but it's a challenge and it's important, okay? He, he doesn't think it's possible to, to discover this, but I think an answer is not you don't have to. I think an answer is it is important to, to investigate whether there's a morally cogent reason for allowing suffering on the part of an omnipotent being. All right. In a materialist worldview, <clears throat> that is a view that all that exists is, is material being. There's no soul angels, God, etc. In a materialist worldview and scale of values, physical or, or emotional or psychic comfort is seen as primary. There, there isn't n nothing beyond that. So fulfillment is physical well-being, integration, <clears throat> pleasure, okay, rest, etc. From this perspective, it is not possible. And this is Mackey's perspective. So if you have that perspective, you can understand why he holds it. I think his perspective is wrong, but from this perspective, materialist perspective, it's not possible to discover a sufficient reason for physical and emotional suffering. It's not possible. But in Aquinas' scale of value, on the other hand, what's primary, it's, he's not a materialist, right? So what's primary for him is spiritual. Matter is very good for him. It's very important, but it's not the most important thing. It's, it's in a scale, a hierarchical scale of value and of being. And it's subordinate to, the, to spiritual values. And in particular, among uh, the primacy of the spiritual for Aquinas, what is preeminent at the top of the heap is interpersonal love, love between persons. This is a great theme in, in Aquinas' works. The greatest good for humans, he argues in his Summa Theologiae, first part of the second part, questions one through five. It's his treatise on beatitude or happiness, human, f human flourishing, human fulfillment. Uh, in that part, he argues uh, philosophically and then later theologically that the greatest good for humans is to be in an everlasting union of love with other persons, but above all with the divine person or persons of God. That's his scale of value. And, and, and that this union is something preeminently shareable with other persons. So it's not just me privately with, with God, but it's something communal. It's shareable preeminently with other, other persons, and it's something to be shared with other persons. It begins in this life for Aquinas, and it continues after death into eternity. Conversely, the greatest evil on the scale of values for Aquinas 
uh, is to be permanently alienated from God and as a result from all other persons and even from oneself, and that's hell. This, of course, already is a theological religious claim, uh, but it's one that Stump, as a philosopher, uses not as the basis for a concrete example of a morally sufficient reason for suffering, that's Aquinas and theodicy, but she uses it as a possible, that is a log logically plausible or consistent example of a morally sufficient reason for suffering. Now that sounds modest and weak, but, and it is in a certain respect, but it's valuable because all you need to do to refute Mackey's position is to show that there's a logically plausible reason for suffering. And then his argument doesn't work because premise three is there can't be one. Well, here's one, and then it's over. Okay. Aquinas, and that's the modest task of philosophy. Theology is going to go, is going to be doing it differently. You'll see in a minute. Hopefully we can move quickly, okay? I hope I'm not going too quickly, but I have to go quick. Aquinas indicates his scale of values, for example, in his commentary on Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15. Here's Aquinas, quote, if there's no resurrection from the dead, it follows that there's no good for human beings other than in this life. And if this is the case, then those people are most miserable who suffer many evils and tribulations in this life. Thomas has this knack for really sympathetically expressing positions of those with whom he disagrees. He's not a, he's not a, I, mean, I don't find him to be a jerk. He's very sympathetic, okay? Even with and maybe especially with people with whom he disagrees. Um, <clears throat> As Eleanor Stump puts it, on the basis of this scale of values, Aquinas then provides, in her words, quote, the morally sufficient reason for God to allow the suffering of an unwilling, innocent, mentally fully functional adult human person, end of quote. And the reason she does that is because she's excluding consideration of other things which are important, like animals or babies. That's one of the most difficult ones, in my opinion. Uh, <clears throat> the reason the morally sufficient reason for God to allow suffering would be the benefit afforded to the sufferer. And there are, so in other words, God uh, doesn't um, uh, have somebody suffer here as a means, as a mere instrument for the good of, of, of the whole, right? So, so everybody gets something good out of it except you, you just die or something, okay? No. For Aquinas, it's very personal in this sense that the suffering of this person is for their good, and it may redound to other people's goods as well. All right, uh, that's a significant point. Um, <clears throat> so the reason, the morally sufficient reason, would be the benefit afforded to the sufferer, and there are two kinds of sufferers in general. Those whose sufferings are altogether involuntary, uh, and she says these are persons without religious faith. She's interpreting Aquinas as as those uh, without religious faith would have suffering altogether involuntary. I'm not sure that's accurate or fair, but that's, that's her understanding of Aquinas. And, on the other hand, those whose sufferings are involuntary but only in a certain respect. That, that would be persons committed to a life of faith which includes accepting sufferings. Okay. So the suffering of the first group of folks, uh, all to get the, the first altogether involuntary sufferer, that suffering contributes to the warding off of a greater harm for her. And the suffering of the second, a partially voluntary sufferer, contributes to providing a greater good for her. So if it's altogether involuntary, the suffering is there just to at least save them from something worse. And if it's somebody who's willing to suffer, would rather not, but will accept it, then that suffering affords them something otherwise unavailable, namely something a lot better. Uh, and in Aquinas' calculus, so to speak, that's eternal life. Stump provides a concrete analogical example or analogy of the first kind of suffering. It's really interesting. If a mother subjected her child to sensory deprivation, confined in a small space so that the child could attain the good of experiencing with gratitude and pleasure the experience of being let out and free out of doors, we would, she says, we would hope social services would remove that child from the mother. But if adults subjected, let's say, Jewish children to just such suffering of confinement to keep them hidden from the Nazis in World War II, we would honor such people. We do honor such people. So we're talking about unwilling sufferers, right? 
In the first case, the good involved doesn't justify subjecting a person to such suffering involuntarily. So that wouldn't be a moral reason for, God doesn't have a good moral reason to make you suffer uh, unwillingly for some good that you may or may not even want. Okay. Uh, but in the second case, the warding off of a greater harm for the unwilling, so in this case, the, the example would be being killed by the Nazis, justifies hiding the children even though that entails the suffering of sens- temporary suffering of sensory deprivation in the closet or under the floorboards and confinement in small spaces. You know, you don't want to treat kids that way, do you? Not usually. But if, you know, there's some greater evil to avoid, you do it. Okay. Uh, Stump puts it like this, quote, for suffering that is involuntary simpliciter, that's absolutely involuntary, warding off a greater harm for a person is morally acceptable reason for allowing suffering if the suffering is the best or only means available, best or only means available in the circumstances to that end, but providing a greater good is not. Now, For those whose suffering is involuntary only in a certain respect, that is partially voluntary, partially not, Uh, she gives a nice example, of a cross-country coach who forces the team at the end of practice to run up one more hill, even though the runners are voicing their complaints. She explains, quote, the greater good of the additional conditioning justifies the suffering inflicted on the team by the coach's demand for more training, because participation on the team is voluntary and carries with it some consent to suffering in the interests of athletic excellence, we view the involuntary suffering of the team as justified by the greater good of the resulting athletic excellence. I think that's a good example. In any event, with all of this said, this is important, it's not the case that Aquinas thinks God created the world so as to produce suffering for people. Aquinas very clearly and repeatedly and consistently says suffering is not intrinsically good. God, that's not his plan A. Okay. He willed God to create morally free people, uh, and he willed that they use their freedom only for the good, not for evil and the suffering that results from evil. But that decision involves allowing people to misuse their freedom, uh, producing suffering. Uh, This is to say that freely chosen human moral evil, sometimes called sin, is the direct cause of suffering. God permits the evil and suffering as a consequence of creating morally free persons, but he permits it only to prevent uh, an otherwise unavoidable greater evil, or in the unwilling, or to produce an otherwise unattainable greater good in the partially willing. On this account, Stump finds a useful set of possible reasons justifying God's permission of suffering, either A, to preserve the sufferer from greater evils, or B, to afford the sufferer a greater good unobtainable without the suffering. Yet, this argument operates more on the abstract and theoretical level, if you haven't noticed. Uh, Aquinas' account, Aquinas's account doesn't intend to answer why this particular person, you, me, is undergoing this particular suffering. This is why Stump devotes much of her book, which I didn't summarize uh, these parts, to a narrative analysis of four biblical cases of suffering. Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac, the story of Job, and Mary of Bethany's loss of her brother Lazarus. She says in John 11, why didn't you come? I called you to come. And he, he wouldn't have died if you made it here, Jesus, Okay, if you know those stories. That, that she goes further than Aquinas in attempting to provide plausible reasons, not just in the abstract, like we were looking at, but for why this particular person or that particular person has this or that particular suffering. And she sees in, this, in these narratives something very interesting, that the persons involved don't understand the, the reason for the suffering initially. And they don't like it. And they ask why. And they want ask for it to be taken away. Okay. But in the process of undergoing it, they discover meaning. They discover the benefits or the fruits that come from it. Okay, but I, I have to skip it, and I'm, 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 I'm sad about that because there's a whole section I was going to summarize where she talks about refolding in the heart's desires that you might lose through suffering. You know, so Job's Job's example, where um, you know he goes through the suffering, and then everything he lost is restored to him like tenfold or whatever, even children, but. The children who died aren't restored. They're new children. So, it, so what if he, the deepest heart 
you know, desire of his heart was to, to live life with those children who are now dead. Yeah? So she, she, Aquinas' account doesn't hit that. So she tries to, to complete it or supplement it by uh, something she calls uh, kind of refolding, like a pro, she uses the example of protein refolding, right? Where um, you have a, a different configuration of the protein, but no loss of the identity of the same protein, but it has a great change in its functioning when it refolds. It's just beautiful, but we'll skip that, okay? Uh, maybe Q&A or whatever, we could talk about it. Or read the book, it's great. Uh, I haven't the time really to do justice to Stump's account beyond this paltry summary. Her book is very long but well worth the effort. As you may have noticed, her account and that of Aquinas moves freely between philosophical and theological perspectives, uh, between what can be known by reasoning apart from appealing to divine revelation, that's philosophy, uh, without revelation, and what can be known with the help of revelation of faith, that's theology. A final point. Her project is very modest. She intends only to show that there may be possible, not actual, reasons morally justifying God permitting humans to suffer. If she can provide just one, and I, I think she provides many, actually, then human Mackey's arguments fail, as I said. In other words, evil, including the evil of human suffering, is compatible with the God of classical theism. And this is also the Christian God. Okay. All right. Now, to the theological theological response. I provided a bit of an outline there on page two. God's eternal uh, <clears throat> life of triune self-giving. For a theological response to the problem, I'd like to reflect with you in the time remaining on a few aspects of the mystery of divine and human suffering as revealed in scripture, in, in, the, in, the, in the Jewish and Christian scriptures. Unlike philosophy, theology doesn't primarily argue demonstratively to prove the truth of a conclusion by natural reason alone. That's not how we work. We make use of philosophy, but we're, we don't do strict philosophy. Um, rather, we, a, a, a theological approach uses natural reason, so it's, we don't turn off the mind, okay? It uses natural reason to reflect on and understand what, in Christian theology, Christians accept as true because revealed by God, who is the truth, who can neither deceive nor be deceived. So it has a very different feel than philosophy. Maybe a feel you, I don't know if, if some of you haven't been exposed to it yet, so maybe disorienting. <laughs> it still disorients me 30 years later. Right. I think that much of the mystery, the Christian mystery of the meaning of suffering comes down to this. Much of it comes down to this. God wants to share his eternal life of triune interpersonal love with us living in a fallen world. That's what I think it's about. Okay? Does that provide the answer that Hume, Mackey, Adams, Stump are looking for? Not quite, perhaps. But it, it, it's not negligible. It's not nugatory. It's not negligible. It's important. <coughs> He wants to share his eternal life of triune interpersonal love with us. So what is that life? What is that inner life of God like? What is that like? Christians believe that there's one God, the God of classical theism, not three, one. Omnipotent, omnibenevolent, omniscient God, who is three persons. The three persons are different from each other, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But they possess the very self-same numerically one divine nature that's infinite, omnipotent, etc. What is this inner life of God like? Uh, in, in the first letter of John in the New Testament, chapter 4, verse 8, we read, people have heard this, some of you have heard this, God is love. You hear that? God is love. How is God love? How is God love? Uh, two great medieval philosophers and theologians, St. Bonaventure and St. Thomas Aquinas, baptized, so to speak, the Platonic axiom, uh, bonum est diffusivum sui, the good, the nature of goodness is to diffuse itself, to spread itself out. Good is self-diffusing. It spreads itself around. And they both saw the absolute perfect manifestation of the good's self-diffusiveness in the Trinity. In the eternal God, the Father, completely giving himself in love by eternally begetting the Son. 
and the father and son together completely giving themselves to each other in love by the spiration or breathing forth. Spiration means breathing forth of the Holy Spirit. The late Benedictine theologian, Father John Quinn, in an article called Triune Self-Giving, One Key to the Problem of Suffering. That's uh, in the bibliography here. I'm going to draw a lot from that. I think it's a wonderful article. Uh, He says that God is love in the infinite self-giving of begetting and spirating. Father begetting Son, Father and Son breathing out the Holy Spirit. Um, The Father, in an eternal act of love, intellectually, not physically, not temporally, outside of time, outside of space, outside of matter, he intellectually, spiritually begets his his eternal Son. How? By self-giving, by communicating the fullness of his infinite divine essence to the Son, who possesses the self-same infinite divine essence. So there's not two essences. When we have kids, they have their own human, human nature. We have ours. Right? So we can die. They can still have theirs. Not, not so in this case. It's the same numerically one divine nature that the Father possesses that he communicates to the Son in an act of love. This self-communication cannot be an emptying because an infinite being cannot experience diminution. This is key. An infinite being can't experience diminution, so there's no emptying here. He gives everything but doesn't lose any of it. He can't. He's infinite. Likewise, Father and Son eternally breathe forth the Holy Spirit, similarly communicating the fullness of that self-same numerically one infinite divine essence again to a third without experiencing any diminution. So even though this is not an emptying, this love of the Father for the Son Son and Father for each other, which is the Holy Spirit. This uh, is not a self-emptying, strictly speaking, a loss of self for the other's sake. It can be said that it is as if the Father, it's as if the Father emptied himself in pouring himself into the Son. And uh, likewise, uh, for the other divine persons, it's as if they emptied themselves. But the self-diffusiveness, the self-communication and love of God's goodness doesn't stop within himself, even if, even though that may be the perfect manifestation of it, it continues. It even gets better. He chooses to create outside of himself uh, rational, free creatures and offer them a share in this eternal life, a life that transcends their nature. So this is key. And so it's a life that's, strictly speaking, supernatural, super naturum, above their nature with respect to the creature, okay? So this is at least some of what it means to say that God is love. Uh, Roman numeral two, sin as the introduction of evil and suffering. Aquinas notes that physical, non-moral evil comes from the nature of finite material being, I'm going to skip that. Um, It's interesting. but uh, Moral evil, sin, right, results from the misuse of human or angelic freedom. God chose to create free rational creatures, and his plan A was that they love and obey him, not so that he gains anything from it, he's the infinite being, uh, but so that they thereby find and receive fulfillment and eternal happiness or beatitude for themselves. And this fulfillment is precisely and essentially a supernatural participation in the eternal life of interpersonal self-giving love. But creating them free necessarily entails the real possibility of the misuse of that freedom. Um, Lying, stealing, murder, abuse, neglect, self-idolization, our sins profoundly wound others. They wound ourselves. They also wound God in his humanity. We'll talk about that in a second. God surely foresaw and permitted this misuse of freedom, but because of his infinite goodness, he does so only for a great good. In the Exultet, the Easter proclamation during the Easter Vigil Mass for Catholics, we hear these words inspired by St. Augustine's meditations on the original sin of Adam in the garden, O Felix culpa, O happy fault that earned for us so great, so glorious a Redeemer. And Paul in Romans 8.28 writes, All things work for the good for those who love God and are called according to his purposes. Number three, God's response, incarnation and the redemptive suffering and death of God himself. If God left us in sin, 
his original plan to share his eternal life with us would be fundamentally thwarted. So that's inconsistent. That's a problem. But on the other hand, if he gave us eternal life, he'd be dishonest and unjust since he said to Adam and Eve, if you eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you'll surely die. This is called the divine dilemma, and it's beautifully articulated by St. Athanasius in his work on the Incarnation. How can man die and yet still have eternal, undying life? It seems impossible. The dilemma's solution is that God, the Son, assumed a human nature without losing his divinity, and in obedience and love, this is called the Incarnation, and in obedience and love, ultimately offered his life on the cross, fulfilling the just requirements of punishment. But he rose from the dead, thereby defeating death and making possible eternal life. The incarnation and death of God the Son is called kenosis by Paul. It's an emptying. In Greek, kenosis is an emptying. And St. Paul speaks of this in Philippians chapter 2, verse 7. He emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. Since the person of Jesus is the divine person of God the Son, and since he possesses not only his eternal, infinite, impassable divine nature, but in the incarnation, this same divine person now possesses and lives in a temporal, finite, mortal human nature. We not only can, but we must say that God the Son suffered and died on the cross, but not in his divinity, in his humanity. But it really was God the Son who endured that as a human. A person is someone who acts and reacts in and through their nature. In his divine nature, the Son can't suffer, but in his human nature, he can and does suffer. God truly suffered as Jesus. Uh, Further, Quinn says something very important. Now we get to the heart of it here. We're almost finished. In the crucifixion of Christ, we catch sight of what he calls the analogical kinship with suffering in the Trinity. Okay, what does that mean? This means that the incarnate Son, in his human nature, acts on earth analogously, similarly, to the way he exists in eternity, because it's the same person. Throughout his life, but especially in his suffering and death on the cross, the Son continues to pour out his being in self-giving love, as he was doing in eternity, but without losing anything. In time, he loses something, because he's finite. It, it It costs. It's suffering. But in this case, now he's not just in his humanity, not just communicating his divine being in eternity with the Father and Holy Spirit, but he's communicating his, fi- but his finite human nature is poured out in a perfect act of unrestrained, self-giving love. Um, Christ himself glosses on this and says, greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And in the complete self-giving of his, of his finite human nature, God the Son does indeed experience diminution and finally death. I'm going to skip over number four, the effects, and go right to the conclusion here, okay? Application, our invitation to this divine life. I mean, the effects are simply, through his death, he defeats sin. Through his resurrection from the dead, he defeats death itself. But that doesn't mean we don't have to suffer and die. We still do. Okay. There are two fundamentally different ways to respond to suffering. And this becomes evident, especially in cases of acute suffering. When our firstborn son was dying of stage four neuroblastoma in the pediatric ICU of Children's Hospital in DC 19 years ago, uh, we became friends with a number of other parents, some of whom lost their children. One of the nurses told us that the mortal suffering and death of a child either crushes and destroys marriages or it brings the couple closer together in love and compassion. Our son survived, we think, miraculously, and so did one of the oncologists. But I've never forgot what that nurse told us. When suffering's acute enough, it compels us to one of only two options. Make yourself a sacrifice of love, outpouring of self, even to the point of death, or let it consume you with a deathly, deadly sorrow, anger, bitterness, hatred. I've seen and experienced uh, both, and perhaps you have as well. The good news of the gospel of Christ is that death is not the final word. Eternal life is possible, and God is inviting you to it. It consists in a supernatural participation in God's life of triune self-giving. The gospel is not that Christ suffered and died so we don't have to. Uh, We have to no matter what, whether we believe the gospel or not. The good news, rather, is that Christ has transformed suffering and death into the means of by which we participate 
in the self-giving love of the Trinity. And he's transformed suffering and death into the vehicle uh, by which we're delivered to eternal fulfillment in God. By uniting people willing to believe in him into his mystical body, his church, Christ offers them a share in this eternal life that is self-giving love. On earth, in union with him, our suffering gains a salvific character. We suffer in Christ, and Christ suffers in us. And in this way, we obtain grace, divine assistance for ourselves and others. But more than this, we begin to live the divine life as children of God here and now by daily giving ourselves to God and others in love. This may be called, number one here in definitions, theomimesis, a reflection or imitation, a mimesis, a reflection or imitation of theos, the life of God in the life of the believer. Theosis is the process of receiving and growing in participation in the divine nature that is being made godlike, starting to enter into the eternal life he's calling us. And the way we progress and live theosis is through kenosis, which is the process of being emptied of some goods and ultimately even of one's own life. So the quote from Romans here, theosis through kenosis, and that's not me, all right? Can you guess who, who, who that is? I work at Steubenville, and my colleague Scott Hahn is a real clever, witty guy, and he, he came up with that phrasing, but he allowed me to use it. But he said, just, just make it your own. Don't tell him I came up with it. But no, he, it's him. It's not me. Theosis through kenosis. All right. Have you ever read Scott Hahn? It's a Hahnism. The passage from Romans goes like this. <clears throat> when we cry, Abba, Father, it's the Spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if we're children, then we're heirs, heirs of God. We're going to inherit God, inherit his life. Uh, fellow heirs with Christ provided, A, we suffer with him. That's kenosis. B, in order that through, right? C, we may also be glorified with him. I consider the sufferings of the present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Okay, so what this means is to be glorified is theosis, to suffer with Christ is kenosis, and we undergo, theos, uh, we undergo kenosis so that we may be brought to theosis, theosis through kenosis. All right, when we want to know why we suffer. When we suffer, we want to know why, the meaning of our suffering, and whether it's compatible with a loving God. Does God still love me? Believers who suffer very often ask God the reason for their suffering. And you read this in scripture. They do this. And they ask God to remove the suffering. Christ asked for this in his humanity in the Garden of Gethsemane. And from the cross. Why did you abandon me? And in Gethsemane, please take this away from me. And it's good to pray like this. It's good. You don't have to be a Christian to pray like that. It's good to do that. God actually does answer these prayers, but not the way we'd have it. He reveals the meaning of our suffering to us, I believe, as we bear it in union with him, in union with Christ who loves us. Prayer, not just philosophizing, but prayer with philosophizing, is necessary, I think, to bear suffering in love. We begin to discover the depths of our suffering's meaning only often after we've endured it, after or at least well into the process. God manifests his love for us by emptying himself in the incarnation and cross. In the end, suffering will be removed and the dead will rise. Suffering and death are finite. They will end. The weight of glory is eternal. Yes. So this might be a bad question because I feel like it's so self-evident to us that free will is good, but I must ask the question anyways. Yeah. yeah. Get an answer. Why is it? So, so you say you know suffering comes out of free will because free will doesn't bump into each other. But why is it that free will is better than no free will in which there is no suffering? And, and, and so uh, the quickest way I can answer it, off the off the cuff, is like this: all created being and goodness is a finite created reflection of the infinite being and goodness of God. There's no other template on which things are based, right? So there's a greater and lesser goodness in being, right? So to be created, fulfilled, and perfected without your consent, isn't it, without the being's consent, it's not a bad thing. It's a perfect eternal tree, you know? That's actually awesome, right? But uh, to, to have consent understanding and consent is even more similar 
to the perfection of intellect and will in God, and therefore it's a greater thing. Now with God, there's no danger of sin, of you know, doing something evil. With us, there is. Okay, yes? If you say God has no potential to make mistakes, would that undermine his ability to have free will in some sense? Yeah, well, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, in this sense, right? There's this notion that kind of dominates in the, in the West, and I think it's because of, um, frankly, John Duns Scotus and some Jesuits. And I, I mean, even amongst... <laughs> no, and I, I think those guys are great in a lot of ways, okay? Okay, I do. But this notion that freedom is the most important, if not the sole feature of the will. And another view is that of Augustine Aquinas, Leo XIII, and John Paul II, which is freedom is, is very good, but it's not the most important thing in the will. The most important thing in the will is union in love to the good, to, to persons, right? Freedom is merely a means to that end, yeah? So, for example, God isn't free to beget a son. If he freely begat the son, then the son would be a creature, be freely chosen. He didn't have to have it, right? Son couldn't be God. So, fr- yeah, so you asked, is freedom God's inability to so, sin? Is yeah. Yeah, he's not free in certain respects, and that's not an imperfection. Only if you, only, it's an imperfection only if you think freedom is the most important thing in the will. And I don't, so it doesn't bother me. Yeah, yeah. Christ is a whole section in Christology where you investigate. Christ was human and had free will, but wasn't free to sin. And that's not a liability. That's actually a perfection. Because sin is contrary to human nature. It's not like, oh, I'm free to sin, so that's a great thing. I'm free to sin, so I brutalize myself and make me like myself like a brute animal. Or something? You know, I don't know. Yes? My question is in regards to the idea of suffering still happening under a loving God. Let's say, for example, hypothetically, that there is a child who gets murdered on the streets. Yeah, yeah. The criminals never caught, the parents can't find their kid. No goodness comes of this. Yeah, yeah. So how, why would this still happen under a loving God if A, there's no good that comes from it, and yeah, B, yeah. it's not to create another greater good? Yeah, yeah. So I don't know. I don't. I mean, it's horrible, right? Uh, Aquinas' attempt, and he's clear on this, it's not to answer specifics, it's to get a general set of principles, right? Applying them is really hard. I'll say this, there's no evident good in that example, but there could be non-evident goods. I mean, Aquinas's principles may apply even if I can't see how. So for example, in that case, it could be, it could be that um, the, child or the child is prevented from a greater evil, though they suffered horribly, unwittingly, because for Aquinas, Physical life is not the top of the scale of values. That child is going to live forever. So there's something later that's important for them that the death preserved them for, you know. So that's, I mean, that's, that's cold comfort, isn't it? I don't think that's in any sense an answer. It just shows that it's not incompatible with a, with a good God. Um, but there, you know, in the, in the Christian tradition, there's the Feast of the Holy Innocents. The, the boys, what, two years old and younger who were systemically slaughtered by Herod who's trying to find the Messiah and kill him. So he killed all the... And, and the church has, from the beginning, honored them as saints. So they weren't just prevented, apparently, from a, a greater evil. They were actually given glory, uh, eternal beatitude, uh, fulfillment, perfection, through that suffering. I'm not saying that... You're, you're, it's horrible. The, the, I mentioned in the beginning, I don't know how to process it. The The... the, the in terms of intellectually, I don't have philosophical answers for it. Um, so I hope nobody ever has to go through that, and if you have, I'm so sorry. You know. Yes. It seems like um, God permits suffering um, for believers in order that we might um, yeah, yeah. grow closer to God. But why could you possibly talk on why God would permit suffering? For yeah, yeah. Believers and unbelievers are not permanent fixed categories in this this side of life. We're, 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 we're mobile. We can go back and forth, right? So, so suffering for an unbeliever can be, C.S. Lewis on the, he has an essay on suffering, a set of essays actually, uh, and Peter Kreef talks about this too. He has a book on suffering. Uh, can be like a wake-up call. You know, like you're living a pleasant life and you have no, you know, no reason to seek after greater goods in Christ or in God, right? So suffering can be a wake-up call so that it prompts an unbeliever to become a believer. I experienced that concretely, right? So very often you go, well, I don't pray to God, but now when everything was falling apart in my life, I said, God help, you know, if, you're, if there is a God up there, can you help me, you know? 
And uh, so, so sometimes suffering for unbelievers, questions why suffering for unbelievers could make them believers. I mean, I, I kind of think that almost all suffering for unbelievers is this side of the grave has something to do with that, something to do with helping them to come to him. You know, sometimes people feel guilty. only pray when things are bad. Don't feel guilty. That's good. You're praying. You know? So, now what if they never be- come to believe? Then Aquinas' principle, which again is like cold comfort in these cases. I, I don't know. I don't feel like I can give you something good here, except to say, well, Aquinas' principle is that at the very least it would save them from something worse. How? I, I don't know. Is sin necessary for suffering? And I want to ask that in reference to the example of Our Lady of Sorrows, who was um, without sin, but she had received suffering from yeah. the cross. Is sin necessary for suffering? In other words, can you have suffering without sin? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Without, you can have suffering without you sinning. There can also be suffering, hypothetically, without any sin ever in, this, in, the, in a hypothetical world where, let's say, there's no rational creatures but it's a physical world where the, the very nature of physical finitude is such that one element precludes another or, 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 or compounds preclude each other or animals consume and destroy plants and then plants consume the corpses of animals. And, you know, I mean, so there can be, and that's suffering. Animal suffering is real. I think Descartes is wrong when he thinks animals are like machines. They're not. They, they can feel and they suffer. So I, I'm not sure that's what you wanted, but you, you're, if you're asking, can there be suffering without sin? Yeah. I th- well, I mean, I think so. Then again, the, the, the biblical account is like, look, the, the created order is subject to corruption because of Adam's sin. So maybe the material universe wouldn't have been subject to corruption. I, don't, I can't fathom what that would mean. Yeah. Another one more question. Um, so the church uses the language uh, of our life on earth as a pilgrimage from earth yeah. to heaven. Yeah, yeah. Um, and because perfection is ultimate union with God that cannot be fulfilled on earth, then is our life on earth, like, fundamentally, like, first, primarily, um, one of suffering, but, like, not one of, like, you know, like, the constant suffering that we see, like, um, like, a harsh suffering, but, like, you know, yeah. we're not with God. No, no, but even, like, a low level, I think absolutely. In this case... I think uh, Prince Gautama Buddha was, was actually very seriously exactly right that uh, because of the passing, if you've, if you've read about Gautama Buddha, the uh, passing, he's the founder of Buddhism, the, 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 the material world, everything in it is passing. Not just the material world, even the created spiritual world. Everything's passing. And so there's suffering kind of baked into the fabric, metaphysical fabric of reality. Now, I think his response doesn't work nicely, but, um, but I do think he, ha- he had that insight. I think that's right, that suffering, even in just kind of a low-level sense. And, and I put on the bibliography, J- John Paul II, Salvifici Dolores, where he opens that letter by saying, suffering is, in a sense, part of what it means to be human in this situation here. Yeah? That everything's passing away, so... The suffering's kind of baked into it. He doesn't say baked into it, but you know, <laughs> woven into the fabric of, 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 of life in this condition. Yes? Um, so you talked about uh, finding meaning after enduring suffering and how uh, St. Aquinas didn't really go into why certain people you know, undergo particular sufferings. Uh, what, do you, what are your thoughts on or how do you account for uh, people's innate desire to make sense of their own experience and sort of retroactively want to find meaning in what they have gone through. And yeah, yeah. do you think that is just like a uh, like a product of human natural reasoning, or is there some sort of divine revelation in that, or does it depend y- on... Yeah, I think it's both, or it could be both. I think it should be both, right? I think... Um, you can't turn off your natural... I mean, you could, but you shouldn't. That's, I don't think that's usually good. Uh, it's a funny balance. You could go crazy and like maybe literally insane because of these questions. They're very hard. On the other hand, you could numb yourself right, and just not look at it. Either option's bad. So I think naturally you have to look at it and search for meaning. I think... Uh, so that's philosophically. And I think... you know, he, I was trying to indicate in this, cla- in this lecture... That there, that there are some promising avenues that may not answer all the questions, but that are beginnings you know, to, to poke at it. I mean, look, we've been at this question for over 2,000 years, right? Epicurus was 
over 2,000 years ago. Okay. Um, but then I think also the, the, the Christian faith offers something real, but it's not the kind of answer that we would want, like a nice patent, cut and dried, tidy answer. It's, okay, you want to know, well, come into it, come through it, trust me, I'm with you. God, where are you? I don't feel you. I don't, you know, and, you know, you pray. I mean, that feels, it feels cheap to say, but it's not cheap. Thank you guys so much. It's great to be here.